And hi everyone, I'm David Honsoli. I'm going to present our work, Tensius Reconstruction of Global Scale Historical Earth's Observation Data by Seasonally Weighted Average. That was developed in OpenJob, the Netherlands. Um, yeah, this is the outline. So I will start with a bit of background and introduction. Then I will roughly show what we worked on with the, for the 10 series reconstruction with a seasonally weighted average. And then I will show some application on uh, aggregated Landsat images. Then I will pass to limitation and challenges and how we are facing them to work on version two of the data. Finally, I will show some possible solution and conclude. So I think everyone is aware that most of satellite images when raw or partially uh, filtered, they still have um, a lot of artifacts, clouds, atmospheric features that limit their usa usage for some application and modeling techniques. As you can see here, these are four row images in Papua New Guinea, uh, derived from the Landsat archive uh, from uh, the GLAD uh, laboratory in Maryland. And they did a great job in harmonizing all the Landsat satellites. So we have a 16 days base um, Landsat at 30 meters. But still, as you can see, this data is difficult to use in some modeling techniques. So what we do um, is a bimonthly aggregation using four images from the original data set. And then we do 10 series reconstructions to get a complete image. Here is a QR code that refers to our preprint uh, pre of the paper that will explain more detail, in more details how we perform the 10 series reconstruction. And here is a, a bit of a sketch on how it works. So we take the time series of the original data. As you can see here, this is only didactical, let's say. We have uh, three missing uh, values in this 10 series. And what, what we do for each value, we reconstruct giving more weight to available values from the same seasonality, but also a lower weight on distance from ta in time, let's say, to avoid propagation of land cover changes or similar. And overall, we, we, always, get a, we always get a complete end series. And depending on the application, this is good enough. But of course, if there are some artifacts or um, uh, outliers in the time series that were not filtered, they will be also propagated in the reconstructed images. Um, here, le we discuss a bit why this is important. So I know that not everyone is happy with reconstructing images and prefer, for instance, to keep the gaps and do modeling with that. But this, of course, depend, depends on the modeling technique that you use. And for instance, if you would do a um, time series um, modelization using the raw data or the gappy data, you would propagate some artifacts or missing values in the final product. Or for instance, if you do a modeling that is pixel-based, or you use the time series, for instance, for phenology or for croplands that use all the images, you would also have a propagation or of both artifacts and missing values. So we prefer to do this, this gap filling or images reconstruction. That is a broad topic. And here we show, for instance, three products derived from the data we worked on, the first uh, from Leandro that is also in the room for grassland mapping. Um, another project at European scale for soil organic carbon from Chamon, that is another room as well. And the time series of gross parametric productivity used, um, produced with light use efficiency modeling. And for all the application, we use the original data and yeah, we still have some artifacts, for instance, that are still due to propagation from our original data, but 
it's maybe 5% or 3% of the images uh, impacting, while if we would use a simple gap filling strategies, we would have a way worse accuracy and artifacts propagation. And also, we connect with the use case tree that I'm working on for OpenEdge Monitor for the LN deg Degradation Neutrality tool. And this is because, as ENCCD and other entities asked us, currently most of the land the degradation neutrality tools are based on 300 meter or 255 meter images. And for small, small piece of land or stakeholders that are, for instance, farm, this is not sufficient because sometimes the plot is even smaller than, than the resolution. But I will uh, talk a bit more in details in the workshop that is like I think in one hour or so also. But let's go back to the um, gap filling or time series reconstruction details. And this is some statistics to give you an idea on how many pixels in the Landsat data are affected by clouds or artifacts, or even no emissions at all when the snow cover in the northern area is too abundant. So you can see here the patterns. For instance, the lighter images are where more data are available toward the time series in 26 years, and darker are where less images are available. So you can see usually in tropics in rainforest, we have lower uh, availability of images, and same goes for northern areas. And this is uh, yearly statistics. So you can see at the beginning when less sensors were uh, collecting images, there were less images available. At the beginning, even less than half of the total pixel. And then we have a slightly higher values for recent years, and it goes about two-thirds of the images available. But still, it's impacting a good chunk of data, and we would have a major artifacts without our strategies. And we want to do that on Landsat because it's the only available product at 30 minutes of resolution that goes before Sentinel, at least between the public available. And we need to deal with the, the gaps that we encountered. I uh, also a small note. Those statistics are referred to the aggregated, be monthly aggregated product. So if we would go for the 16 days base one, we would have even less available data. Um, in terms of quantity of data, we are dealing with a petabyte scale input data from GLAD. And we have uh, here's some statistics. I also want to specify that we provide the data with a QA that specify if the uh, value was gap filled or was already available in the graded product. And we have um, a total of pixel uh, combined combine with time frames of 10 to the 14. That is like uh, the number of grains of sense in a large bridge, for instance. And as fun fact, we are storing about 600 terabytes of gaps. Uh, but then we had to use high performance computing, uh, fast IO, and uh, advanced programming combined with our methods to reconstruct the entire data set. And we currently have about 100 terabytes of images for version one. Um, it's a B monthly based, eight bits. We Push, we will push to monthly 16 bits in the second version, so we will get about 40 terabytes of data, but that's quite a lot of computation, and you may wonder why do we want to recompute this huge chunk, and uh, it's also quite costly computation. And the reason is that we have severe artifacts in some areas, so this is comparing NDVI in Canada, for instance, for between comparing between summer in July August and February 2022. This is the summer image. You see there, there are no major artifacts. The, um, the details are quite good. 
Now the animation will scroll and see. So even at 30 meters, we don't see major issues. It's quite good data. But if we go instead to winter months, for instance, in January, you already see the switch between the two images. And if we zoom in, we see severe artifacts, usually with shapes of Landsat scenes. And also, you will see more in details with uh, stripes from Landsat 7. Uh, that was a broken sensor, so you can see here. And those are the three main causes of this kind of artifacts. So the Landsat stripes, the difference in scenes, that, and the revisit time that does not always coincide. And also, we have the um, masking uh, based on the QA that not always catch when there is a cloud or when there is an atmospheric aberration. And the result is this, um, I don't know, Picasso, compared to this data from winter. And another big problem is that the northern area have a few months of snow cover in winter, and this means you can see for Norway that here, systematically in winter, we have no images at all because the data is not um, georeferenced and we have a pure, uh, not a number from the, from the data. So what happens is that the summer images are usually propagated in, um, in winter, and you can see that in the Athens series of Norway, could look like the one in Papua New Guinea for uh, crop. And this is also a big bias in our modeling. So we want to solve several problems. Sorry for the verbose slide. I didn't have time to do a better job. But this is a summary of all the issues we encountered in version, in version 1 and some ideas we have to fix them in version 2. So first, as I anticipated, we want to go to a finer resolution in time, so we go to monthly. And also, we will keep the original data in 16 bits, because for uh, soil monster or for uh, crop and phenology detection, this is quite important. Um, finally, we want also to fix the stripes from Landsat 7. Because, for instance, in 2012, we only have images from Lansan 7, so it's a total amount of stripes over the images. And first, we need to identify which parts of images are uh, containing stripes and then reconstructing them. For the reconstruction, we test with uh, in-paint or spatial methods, and we obtain quite good results. And to identify which chunks are cor uh, corrected or affected by stripes, we got a mm, FFT score based on the two-dimensional FFT. And we know that stripey images have a specific pattern, and this helped us in identifying them. Uh, then we also want to mask artifacts due to the scenes that we saw before. And this, we, it, this is done comparing NDVI with a, a product from Modis that usually have a better masking. When the difference between the two is too high, we um, consider the pixel outlier and we remove it. But I will show more this in more detail. And also, we want to insert back the snow somehow. Uh, this we still don't have the details, but we will use Modis 10.8.2 to detect which month, which, which date, and which location uh, as a snow cover. And if it's a snow cover and a gap, we will fit a s simple model to re reconstruct the spectral behavior of Landsat for that pixel. But I will show some details. This is for the stripy images reconstruction. So usually, the pattern has this orientation. And you can see from here, this is two-dimensional Fourier transform. And you can see that the same harmonics are more highlighted. 
And this is a common factor between all images with this pattern. So we remove the central part and we check how much is the value in this area. And this allows to identify them. And if that's the case, we use fast marching method to reconstruct the images. This is the result, for instance. And we do this by small chunks because sometimes not all the time is only affected by stripes, but also from clouds. And in that case, we, we don't want to fill the clouds with special methods because we would have even worse artifacts. Um, then for the outlier removal, this is a comparison. So this is what we currently have. And this is something similar to the animation I showed before. It's Norway, too. And you can see that, for instance, here, there is this um, not detected cloud present in the aggregated product that then propagates toward the reconstructed tiles, while masking with modis allows to remove this and other small artifacts around, and we have a, a much cleaner final product. Um, summarizing, analysis readiness is a bit controversial definition because it depends on who performs the analysis and what's the technique the person uses. And this is a problem for Landsat, but it also applies for Sentinel-2 or Harmonize, Sentinel, and Landsat. And second, we are now working on a second version in which we want to fix the limitation and challenges we encountered in version one. And as for the ver first version, we struggle a bit in finding a place where to store the data because uh, we have a Zenodo platform, but for, for 400 terabytes, that's not an option because the buckets are 50 gigabyte size. And yeah, we still need to figure it out, but we have some options. So we will publish the data and as soon as possible. As, and our estimate is to have version two ready in a few months. And that's all. Thank you for your attention.